Hello, and welcome back to CST2120. So in this lecture, I'm going to be covering browser storage. So first part of the lecture, I'm going to cover uh, cookies, which is a more traditional way in which uh, you can have sort of persistent data stored from the server, like on the client. Um, and then the second half of the lecture, I'm going to cover HTML5 local storage. And that's what you're going to be using in Coursework 1 uh, to store the registration login and login information and top scores information. Coursework 2, you're probably going to use HTML5 local storage uh, for customer tracking recommendation. And uh, Coursework 3, you know, maybe you'll find some uses there as well. So it's a pretty, you know, these are pretty handy technologies and kind of pretty core to the whole kind of web development thing. Okay, so cookies. Um, you probably heard of cookies just through the annoying sort of pop-ups that EU legislation forces everyone to do these days. Um, and what cookies are is small text files on the user's computer. And the purpose of cookies is to be able to remember information about the user so that uh, a website, the sort of server, <coughs> can kind of customize things to some extent for each individual customer and remember, you know, when that customer visited them last, the kind of things they bought, you know, pro you know, more realistically in the modern world, you know, their kind of browsing patterns, how much time they spent on each page and, you know, probably, you know, they're building up some kind of sophisticated profile of each individual customer so they can target advertising to them and target um, other things, you know, products to them as well, yeah? So in a more sort of trivial, benign example, <coughs> Uh, the user might visit a web page, uh, their name could be stored in a cookie. Um, when they next communicate with the server, that cookie is sent to the server, and then the server can then, you know, customize or remember, even, you know, just remember the name of the person who visited them and when they visited them last as well, yeah? But obviously they can contain lots of, you know, other kinds of information as well, yeah? So here's a little example. So here we've got a, a kind of browser. And the browsers, you know, this the person here is looking at products, you know, related to a pet, to a dog, age five, who's, you know, got black black fur, right? Um, and then the, the web server then drops a cookie on the client's um, computer uh, inside the, you know, browser storage somewhere um, when they're looking at these products. Um, and then the next time the customer goes and visits the, the, the server, the same server, then that browser will then send that cookie back up to the web server here, yeah? Um, containing the information that the last time they came, they looked at, you know, products for dogs with black fur who are age five, you know, something like that, yeah? Um, and then, and then the, the web page, knowing this information, so it's got this cookie back because the customers come back again, um, and then they can now sort of, you know, have some kind of banner advertisement for, you know, dog shampoo for kind of middle-aged dogs or something like that, yeah? Um, and so the cookies in this case, is being controlled uh, server side, um, but you can also write to the control. You know, you can write and read from cookies, kind of using JavaScript on client side as well. So with JavaScript on the client side, um, we can use document cookie property to create, read, and delete cookies. We can say we can if we do document dot cookie username John Doe, then the key for that cookie will be uh, username and the value will be John Doe. This will be deleted when the browser is closed. You could maybe use it to sort of track some information across multiple pages, maybe a basket, something like that. But you can also set an expiry date, you know, at some point in the future, and then the cookie will be preserved and then deleted after that expiry date. By default, the cookie will be limited to a particular page on a particular website. Um, but if you set the path um, to like, you can set the path to different values. So you can have it to like a sort of subfolder or, you know, um, virtual subfolder on the website or to the entire website. So if you want to read a cookie, then we just assign a JavaScript variable, a document cookie contains all the cookies. And the cookies are kind of in this kind of like long string. So you have a cookie is actually a bunch of key value pairs along with a kind of expiry date of those key value pairs. Um, so if you want to change a cookie, you just sort of assign it. You know, again, you can change the expiry date and all that again. So you just reassign it basically and that changes it. Um, and if you want to delete it, you set the expiry date to be in the past. So it's a bit crude, to be frank, you know, having to mess around with expiry dates in order to delete a cookie, but, you know, that's just how they work because it's old technology, yeah? So cookies are stuck together in a sort of long string. Um, so if you do document cookie, that's the sort of first statement. I'm adding username equals David Gomez as the first sort of key value pair in the cookie. 
and then if we do a, a subsequent assignment, if it's got a different key value, key, pair, key, then it'll append this key value pair to this key value pair in the cookie, yeah? So now if we do alert document cookie, we can see we've got the username equals David Gomez and hello Fred are both contained within the cookie, yeah? So cookies have disadvantages. Uh, the storage is limited to four kilobytes. There's a bunch of messy string processing required to extract the value of a particular variable. You can get this JavaScript of the web, but it's not like terrible. Um, and there are advantages as well though. So the big advantage of cookies is that they're automatically sent to the server and they can be accessed sort of server side as well as client side. And so cookies are sort of often used for kind of session management. Yeah, the, the, the server will drop some kind of cookie with a random sort of ID. Um, when the user logs in and each time the user interacts with the server they'll use that random id to pick up to, to to you know to maintain track of the fact that the user's logged in because http is what's called a stateless protocol so each time you interact with the server unless you've got something like a cookie to keep tra to track the customer's interactions then you've really no idea who's interacting it's just you know someone's just requesting some pages or sending some data to you so you need cookies to or, or local storage or something to track interactions across multiple pages and cookies do a good job of that um, but you know they have some disadvantages too they've got this limited storage and they're a bit of a pain the pain um, to manage um, on the you know within javascript yeah because this expiry date thing and the you know the the fact that all the keys are stuck together yeah key, key value pairs are stuck together so um and that's the reason um that we've got people have come up with html5 local storage is sort of more modern way of doing storage within the browser um that can be managed by javascript so html5 local storage simple way of storing key value pairs in the browser so the storage just like cookies is specific to each domain now this storage can be persistent, um, so if you use local storage, that storage is going to stay forever. Or you can use session storage, in which case when you uh, close the browser tab, um, that everything that's in session storage will be deleted. Yeah, You've got loads of storage, like 5-10 megabytes, so it's, you can put as much as you like in there, really. So as I mentioned, um, you've got local storage, which just stores data with no expiration date, and session storage will store data just for one session, and the data is deleted when the browser is closed. So it's a, and this is as I'll explain, this stuff, this local storage and session storage are much easier to use than cookies, um, because you you know you just use the key value, you can store stuff and remove stuff without messing around with expiry dates and without messing around processing stuff from a long complicated string. So and they're much more intuitive as well. So HTML local storage has two ways of putting stuff into local storage and getting it out. You have this rather crude kind of set item and get item methods, which you know I can't see why you ever want to use them. And then you've also got uh, this, just because local storage is kind of treated as a JavaScript object to some extent, then you can just add things into local storage by a pen using, just using properties just like you do with any JavaScript object. So if we do local storage dot last name, that will put something <coughs> into local storage that has the key last name and the value Smith in this case. And when we want to retrieve it, we can just do local storage last name, which in this case will return Smith, yeah? And as I'll show you in the examples, I haven't got an example here, you also use the, sometimes it's handy using the kind of square angle brackets to access properties of the local storage object, if you like, um, because you may not know the actual name here. You may be pulling that from somewhere else, as I'll show you, yeah? And session storage works exactly the same way, except when you, it'll, all the data in session storage is deleted when the sessions, when the browser tab's closed. Okay, so sometimes you just want to get rid of everything in local and session storage, so you can just do these, you have these clear methods like local storage.clear or session storage.clear. And um, when you're working with local and session storage, um, I would strongly recommend that you open up the Chrome developer tools, hope you're using Chrome. And within these tools, you can see the contents of local storage and session storage. So you can check that your code's writing the correct kind of stuff there. And you'll, when you come to demonstrate coursework one, first thing I'm gonna do to, when we're looking at your coursework is open up the Chrome developer tools to make sure that your code's working in the correct way. So I strongly recommend um, that you use these developer tools as you're working with local and session storage to see what's going on with them, yeah? So I thought, you know, let's let's chuck in an example. Um, this is the sort of most basic example I can think of, really. So I'll, I'll go through the code in a second, but first I'll do a demo. So let's do a little demo of that. So here we've got just a simple page. Um, so it says welcome. So currently, if we look in local, so here at the bottom, if you go to the application tab or application section of the developer tools, normally working in the console, right? But if you just click on application, 
And then here you'll see local storage and also session storage. So session storage currently has some stuff linked to Visual Studio Code, which we will just ignore. And local storage is empty, yeah? So we whack in a name, we've just got David there, might as well use that. Click on Remember Me. And then what this is doing is dropping into local storage. It has the key username and the value David. And then it's also updating the web page itself. But this up, Hello David is persistent, right? If I refresh the page, <coughs> initially you can see it kind of goes welcome and then it switches over to Hello David because the JavaScript is loading up the username from local storage and using that to update the title. So in this case, the page is customized for me because I've been to that page before. And if I click clear storage, then that deletes everything there. And then it goes back to the sort of standard generic welcome message. So let's just go through the code, make sure you understand it. So the first part, um, just, you know, standard HTML, explained all this in the lecture on forms. Um, so that's what you're actually seeing there. And then the button has an event store name. So when you click on remember me, that's what that's calling this function here. And so there's the first line here, it's just pulling out the name from the input field here. Second line then is it, yeah, that's just, that's, uh, blah, 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 that's doing the same thing. Oh yeah, that's changing the header. So that's changing the welcome message here from welcome to hello, David. That's what the next line doing here. And then here, local storage dot username. So you remember that I was using the key username to hold the name of the user. So that's what's doing here. So local storage dot username equals the name. Um, so that's the storage part of it. And then the retrieval part, when we refresh the page, whenever the page is loaded, it's calling this show name function. And inside there, it sees if username is a key that exists within local storage. If it's not undefined, then we look in, then it's going to pull out local storage username and use that to customize the, you know, the welcome message. So whenever I refresh it, it goes into local storage, sees if username is defined. If it is defined, then it extracts the value of that, of that associated with that key and uses that to, to customize the page. So let's say cookies, as I mentioned in the first half of this lecture, they exchange every time the client interacts. Every time the, the server sends a, uh, a response, then it includes the cookies. Every time the browser sends a request, that includes the cookies as well. So they're constantly kind of synchronizing the cookies um, automatically behind the scenes, so to speak. Whereas the data in HTML local storage, it can only access locally by JavaScript. The server has no idea what's going on in the browser's local storage unless the JavaScript within the browser pulls out that, something in that local storage and sends it to the server. And that's fine. A lot of the time you're going to be using, you know, uh, Ajax, which is like a, this kind of communication mechanism between Java and the ser JavaScript and the server that doesn't involve loading the page. So JavaScript can send, you know, can ping the server with bits of stuff from local storage if it needs to, but the disadvantage of local storage and session storage is that the, the JavaScript has to manually do it, if you like, yeah? It's not, it's not done automatically in the way cookies are done. And obviously local storage is the advantage of, you know, simplicity of use and greater amounts of storage. So I personally like local storage, but cookies certainly have their place, particularly when it comes to things like session management. Okay, so the data that we're storing in local and session storage uh, is a string, yeah? The key's a string, the value is a string. So if you want to put a number into local storage, the browser will convert it to string when it's stored, and then it'll sort of remain as a string when it's retrieved. But then with this type, kind of dynamic type management, it'll sort of be able to convert it into different things, you know, depending on how you're using it, yeah? Which sometimes can be confusing, yeah? So I had a quick go with Booleans, but I mean, you know, I've done this recently, but you know, Booleans might be a little bit tricky. You might have to compare the Boolean. So the Boolean here, local storage.bool is a, is a, so in this case, I'm storing it as a, boolean right but it's going to be converted to a string when it's stored so then i can compare uh the local boolean uh i think i think that comes out as true right here so the, so when you do local storage.bool it returns something that's typed of string so it's safest to compare it to a string um and then and then it might actually work you might actually, this this should return true i think yeah so just be aware that when you retrieve it it's going to be it'll be retrieved as a string however you store it yeah so with arrays and objects, more complex things, you can't store them just as they are. They won't be automatically converted into strings. Instead, you have to use json.stringify to convert arrays and objects into strings. And then when you retrieve them, um, you convert them back into objects and arrays using json pass. Okay, so you have to do the conversion process to and from strings, or it won't work unless there's been some like modern fix in JavaScript since, since I did these lectures. 
So let's just give an example of that, yeah? So here we've got an object. So this is a standard JavaScript object. It's got a name, an age, and so on and so forth. Um, now, if I want to store that in local storage, um, I can use the key local storage. But the value associated with that key has to be a string. So I need to do JSON stringify to convert this object here into a JSON string, which just means putting quotation marks around the, the keys, right? That's pretty much it, yeah? And when I want to get that object back out of local storage, um, I have to do JSON pass. So local storage.john is a key. Um, sorry, look, John is the key. Local storage.john is the, the JSON string that I put there. That's a representation of the object. Now I need to convert that representation of the the string representation of the object in local storage back into an object using JSON pass. So the retrieve DOM object is not a string anymore. It's actually a, a JavaScript object again. And since it's a JavaScript object, I can do retrieve John object dot name, retrieve John object dot name, age, etc., etc. Yeah, <coughs> I can access things as I as I was originally able to access things in the John object because the string that comes out of local storage doesn't have the property na name or age. It's only the past string that's converted back into an object that has those properties. So I thought, um, to kind of consolidate and explain all this, I'd uh, give you some examples of kind of registration and login. So I'm giving you this stuff um, to help you with Coursework One, obviously. You're welcome to use this code in whatever way you want within Coursework One or in subsequent Coursework as well. I mean, that's a general rule that I have for my, the courses that I run, that you're always welcome to use example code that I give you. Um, but just bear in mind, I've obviously designed this example code, so it's not going to do everything for you, yeah? You're going to have to understand this example code and adapt it and incorporate it into your projects and extend it, and then you can get, you know, full marks for the registration login. If you just copy and paste this stuff straight into your web page without any modification, you'll get some marks probably, but certainly not the full marks, yeah? Quite a long way, less than half, basically. Yeah. Um, and even then, you're going to have to fiddle with it a bit. Okay, so um, I'll, sh I'll show you how this works anyway. So, I'm, you know, this is uh, just to give you an illustration of roughly what I'm expecting um, within Coursework 1, yeah? So here we've got a registration page. So again, as usual, whenever I'm working with local storage, I always have the application tab open in the developer tools. Now, let's... Uh, register some users yeah so if we do d at g.com for example some kind of lousy password and then we could do you know susan jane.net you know put one two da, 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 whatever and then we could do you know bob example you know, whatever yeah uh it doesn't really matter yeah so as you can see as i register these um it's storing with the key is the email address here which is assumed to be unique and then the value is a JSON representation of a JavaScript object that contains the information about each user. Yeah, so this is the email and the password. So when you're doing this in your own project, if you want to get a decent mark for this part of the components of Coursework One, um, you obviously need to add more values to here, like the name, the address, and so on and so forth. Yeah. So here we've got three users uh, stored in local storage. Session storage hasn't got anything in yet. Um, yep, yeah, I think that's about it. So now we come to the, the registration side of this. Yeah. And so let's try, firstly, try something uh, Something doesn't exist, yeah? So, you know, whatever, da -da, dot net, whatever, yeah, some random email address, some random password. So firstly, note um, that what I've got here, and that you need to do this as well, is I've got error messages. Yeah, it doesn't recognize the fact that this, this email address doesn't exist in local storage, and it's giving me an email address, yeah? And then if we do one that does exist, dhg.com, and the incorrect password, and click login, we get password not correct. And then we type in the correct password, and then we get this kind of logged in thing, yeah? So generally, you should just give them an ambiguous feedback to the user, like your username or password are not correct, or the combination of username and password is not correct, because otherwise people might try... Um, uh, people might try... People will know that the email is valid and then they can try random passwords, although you should presumably lock them out after a certain number of retries anyway, but never mind that, yeah? So what this has done, um, when this person logged in, it dropped a, another key value pair inside session storage this time, and the, the key was logged in user email and the value d at g.com. So again, this isn't something that you do use on a commercial website, but you can, you're welcome to use this just to get the feel of how to use local storage. That's the purpose here, because obviously in a, in a local, if we were using this commercially, 
Um, this would never do because I could just pretend to be logged in from, I could pretend to be logged in from any user and get access to any user's account if I did it this way. Yeah, instead, as I explained, the server drops a sort of complicated session key, randomly generated session key as a cookie, or it could even be local storage. And then because you can't guess that session key, you can't, you know, hack your way into someone else's account. But anyway, in this case, we're just doing it simply just to get the principles here. So we've dropped a sort of key of logged in user email and the value here is d at g.com. So that my code can then look for, knows that someone's logged in, d at g.com, and note that this will work even if I refresh the page. So when I refresh the page, it's looking in local storage and then getting rid of the login stuff and um, replacing it with the information message there. So if I delete that and refresh the page, then you know the person's not logged on anymore. Okay, so I think that's clear enough. Right, so let's just run through this registration login code, yeah? So the so this is bog standard stuff that I covered in um, the lecture on forms. Don't need to worry about that. When they click on the button, then it calls the store user function. And what this is doing here is it's declaring a user object, completely empty object. Then it's adding a property, a key to this object uh, email, which has whatever the user entered the form. And it's adding a password to whatever user entered in the password field here. So it's built up an object with email and password contained in it. You know, that's what... Uh, uh, that's what we got here, right? We've got the... This is the object here. JSON representation of that object. Okay, let's get back to the slide. Yep, okay. So it's building up a... This is building up the object. Then it's converting that object into a JSON string and storing it uh, in local storage. And note that I'm using the square brackets here because if I just did dot user object dot email, then that would be creating a property called user object, but actually I don't want that. I want the contents of the variable user object dot email. So in that case, I need to put the square brackets around it so it doesn't interpret user object as a property name. It interprets the contents of that variable, uh, the value of that variable uh, email uh, instead of just email as a string by itself, yeah? Um, okay, and then it just tells the user that it's successful, yeah? Okay, and then if we look inside, as I said, so the so in this case, just to clarify this, so user object dot email, in this case, the value of that is f at m dot net, yeah? And then the it's associated with this uh, JSON representation of the object holding the user's details. Now login, um, it's, it's, you know, hopefully it should be fairly simple. You should be getting this by now, yeah? So we do the same kind of stuff. We fish out the email address from the login form. Then we look to see inside local storage if that email, the va if uh, a user with that email exists in our system. Yeah, we look in local storage to see if there's a key. Again, we're using square brackets here. There's a key um, that corresponds to the email address that the user's entered, yeah? And if it doesn't exist, then we give this, you know, email not recognized message, which I said is problematic if it's a real website. And then what we do next, assuming that email is valid, um, then we're going to pull out, um, we're going to extract local storage email here. That's the string containing the JSON representation of the user's data. Then we're going to convert that back into a JavaScript object. That's this user object. And then we're going to get the password out that the user entered. And we're going to check to see if that password that the user entered corresponds to the password that they stored when they registered, um, which is held inside this user object, which is extracted from local storage. And that's a little bit of a long story here, but it's actually fairly simple, yeah? And if it matches the password, then we say, great, you're logged in, all the rest of it, yeah? And if it, um, and then what we do, if, if they've logged in successfully, um, in session storage, we use the key logged in user email and store as the value associated with that key, the email address of that user, yeah? And so that is the bit here, right? So if we look, let's just log in again. Uh, I think it's one, two, isn't it? So if you look here, we've got logged in user email, that's just the key, which is, you know, just single key. And then the value is d at g.com, which is the email of the user who's actually logged in, yeah? And if, uh, Password's not correct, we give them some kind of error, yeah? So yeah, that's what I just showed you, yeah? So they've got the key, logged in user email, and then the values, the, the email address of the person that's logged in. Um, and just another point, obviously, if we're storing passwords in local storage, that's re not remotely secure either. So view Corsair Guan as an exercise in learning JSON, local storage, and all the programming stuff. It's certainly not an illustration of how you should build a secure website, yeah? Okay, um, so the final bit of this, um, this login stuff, is we've got an event window on load, 
And whenever that, when the wind page loads, we're calling this check login function. And that's uh, looking to see if in session storage, we've got a variable called logged in user email containing the email of someone who's logged in. If that exists, if it's not undefined, um, then we pull out um, the user object again and use that to uh, say, you know, this particular person's logged in, yeah? And to pull it out, it's again this sort of slightly convoluted thing. So remember in session storage, we've got a variable, a key logged in user email that contains the email of the, of the user who's logged in. So we put that in square brackets, so we get the actual email address, not just, you know, the, the name of the key. And then we extract that from local storage. So now that's going to be the uh, JSON representation of an object containing the user's details. We convert it from JSON back into a JavaScript object. That's what gives us the user object here. And once we convert it into user object, we can then do user object email to, to pull out the actual name or email address or whatever we've got in there. Yeah. So obviously, um, so don't worry about the security, privacy sort of stuff. Um, the coursework one is not intended to teach you that. It's intended to teach you how to use JSON, how to use, uh, how to write JavaScript in the browser, how to do dynamic web pages, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, we'll, we'll cover. We'll build more secure websites later. Yeah. So, and then, but even within the limited scope of coursework one, there's obviously many improvements you can make to the registration login. Yeah. Firstly, you can store more attributes. There's marks for that in the marking criteria. Things like name, address, and so on. Please don't store, uh, you know the credit card numbers, you know, and as a general rule, just store the minimum that you need uh, from the user in order to do the task that they need to do. Obviously, if they need, if you're, they're ordering something online, then they're going to have to give you their address, but they don't need to give you their date of birth uh, unless possibly, you know, they're buying alcohol or something like that. Yeah. Obviously, you should validate user input. Again, there's marks for that in the coursework one. Um, you shouldn't just let the user sort of blatantly overwrite other users. I mean, if this is a proper website, you do some kind of email validation, but at the minimum, you should check to see if the user already exists. And a sensible thing to do within the user object. So if you look at the, where's the user object gone? Uh, yeah, should I, right, so here's the user object, yeah? So a sensible thing to do when they register would be to add the, um, the top score, yeah? Because you wanna, you're gonna be using this user data here to generate the rankings table, yeah? So it's sensible to put it in with a top score of zero at registration time, yeah? Okay, so I've given you example code um, in the week nine sort of section of the course website. As I said to you before, you're welcome to incorporate this example code into your projects, but if you don't change it and you just don't do much with it, you're not gonna get very high mark for those components, yeah? You're gonna, I've deliberately designed the example code so that's given you a good start, but it hasn't taken you the whole way. So you'll, you'll get less than half marks probably less, probably around a third, just using the, the example code as is, yeah? And so that's obviously not gonna be enough to, you know, get a good mark, yeah? So I recommend you use the example code if you want to, you're welcome to do that, but I recommend that you take it further and, and develop and adapt it. And by doing that, you'll actually learn how this technology works, yeah? So modern JavaScript tutorial, again, it's got a nice chapter and all this kind of stuff. I, I like this tutorial. Um, you can also have a look in head first HTML5 programming. This used to be the, um, textbook for the course, but because it's published in 2011, all the JavaScript's sort of pretty out of date. Um, but it has got a bunch of stuff on, on using local storage and session storage. And it's a nice accessible book. It's a pity they haven't done a more recent version of it. Okay, so in this lecture, I've introduced you to cookies and HTML local storage. You're going to be lo using local storage and session storage for um, to do the registration and login on your game website. As I said, you're also probably going to use it for tracking recommendation in your e-commerce website. And there's probably applications of, of it as well, you know, in Coursework 3 and beyond. Okay.